So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Uttam. Uttam was our faculty five years ago. He uh, did his uh, PhD from the Indian Institute of Science in applying remote sensing data to study various urban sprawls and develop algorithms for that. So before that, he spent uh, he did a master's in uh, Holland, a B.E. in Computer Science, Masters from Holland and Ph.D. at the Indian Social Science. After he joined us, within a matter of six months, I think, he got selected as, you know, NASA has this uh, program of selecting global research fellows. They select about six at one time, and they are NASA fellows for a period of three to four years. So he got selected as one of those six in that year. So he went to NASA and he worked in NASA for almost four years, three years first as a fellow, and then it got extended. He worked in NASA and did quite a bit of, during that time he moved, he started applying principles of machine learning, deep learning into remote sensing analysis. Etc. And then at the end of that time, he expressed a desire to come back to this institute and uh, the governing body approved that request and he joined back and he got selected as the Infosys uh, development professor which we normally give it to an assistant professor at the early stage career. He just assumed that about a few months ago. So, Uttam. Good afternoon all of you. Uh, thank you Professor Rajgopal for the introduction. Uh, it's a privilege uh, for me to get introduced by a senior professor of the institute. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I will uh, begin my talk. Uh, so there are two parts in the talk. Some of the initial part is about the background work which I did before joining NASA and then how this work led to some of the uh, large scale geospatial data analysis. So before I show all the results at a, at a global scale, I'll take you through some of the earlier works which I did as part of when I joined uh, IIIT Bangalore before and as part of my PhD research. Okay. So, uh, more specifically, I will be focusing on um, sub-pixel learning algorithms, so which might uh, be a new topic to some of you and uh, some of you might be already aware. So, generally, we uh, when we classify any image, we uh, assume uh, there are fixed number of classes and we give one uh, one single class to each of the pixel. Whereas in sub-pixel learning algorithm, we focus on uh, on assigning multiple classes to a given pixel. So we will see uh, that uh, from uh, in uh, some time from now. So these are the some of the areas in which I work: data mining, uh, remote sensing, GIS, uh, uh, digital image processing, and processing of large-scale geospatial data. I also uh, uh, like to work on free and open source softwares for various uh, applications and this is the agenda which uh, I'll be uh, covering today and talk about little uh, talk a little bit about land use land cover remote sensing geospatial analysis for uh, some of you who are not aware of these terms and then slowly I will take you into the motivation and the objective of the work what led to this kind of work and the uh, one of the most important part of the entire talk is the mixed pixel problem where, where people have been working all around the globe to solve this and uh, I'll show you some of the case studies done on this problem and then finally show you some of the work which was carried out at uh, NASA Ames. So when we talk about uh, natural resources, what are these resources? The resources that occur naturally such as land, water, uh, and which requires planning to see that there is sustainab sustainability in the system. Okay, so uh, planning requires accurately and timely data and remote sensing is one of the way to acquire this timely data to monitor the changes happening on the earth. Okay, analysis of this uh, data would help us in land use and land cover dynamics analysis and this has also been uh, uh, assumed to be one of the very important topics by all major global space agencies including ISRO, uh, European Space Agency, Japan Space Agency and so on. Okay, so let me introduce uh, you to the term land cover and land use. Land cover refers to the physical or biological cover present on the surface of the land. For example, whatever you see as water, vegetation, bare soil, etc. 
whereas land use in uh, specifically refers to a term in terms of human context how do humans utilize the land for example building construction that may be either residential or commercial etc how do you utilize the given land cover uh, in recent times large scale uh, land cover land use changes are happening around the globe and these have some very uh, detrimental effects so here you can see large scale farm tracks being converted to residential apartments water bodies being filled up and converted to uh, buildings so these are uh, these are pictures taken from in and around bangalore and in some sense they also co uh, cause lot of uh, Uh, environmental concerns from global warming to pollution of air soil water biodiversity loss uh, alteration in rainfall uh, flash flood and so on so this is a this is a picture taken from one of the sites in kolar district where there was there used to be a very uh, very uh, nice green cover and some water bodies which is now totally barren so one of some of the experiments were also carried out in this district now looking at these changes happening around the globe there is a need to study this land use land cover change because it will help us to uh, cater to the uh, adaptations and uh, look at the management policies which are required to uh, stop this or to or to mitigate the problem so this has also been identified as one of the uh, very important challenge for sustaining the earth or sustaining the global environment as per the uh, nrc report in 2001 uh, at washington dc usa now uh, to introduce you to the term remote sensing it's very uh, very obvious looking at the two words you sense something remotely that is from a distance so as you can see in the figure here the two there are uh, space borne satellites which keep rotating around the earth and keeps gathering data in the form of images for for, at the, for the surface of the earth so these images are captured by some pre calibrated sensors which captures the signal converts them into images in digital format and then they are transmitted back to the earth so for india uh, nrsc is the agency national remote sensing center which is located at hyderabad where all the data is uh, captured and stored and then is subsequently distributed to the all the stakeholders there are four special properties of the data which we often uh, encounter or we take into account to work on any algorithm or to work on any problem so these are uh, spatial spectral geometric and temporal so to make it simplify uh, remote sensing is something like taking selfies of the earth, earth itself okay so briefly to explain you the process uh, the sunlight hits the earth it can hit any object maybe tree or a building or a road and then goes back to the the reflected uh, light goes back to the Uh, atmosphere where some some of them are captured or sensed by the satellite so these are space borne satellites with now very often uav that is unmanned aerial vehicle are also being used to capture these uh, reflected data these data may be in the form of multi spectral hyper spectral panchromatic or unmanned aerial vehicle data sets so i will show you some later ex experiments on these data sets now once the data sets are captured they are stored or they are captured in various wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum so these can range from blue to far infrared or even thermal infrared each band or each wavelength have very specific applications for example the uh, near infrared band is very useful in uh, studying vegetation or global forest change they are also useful in studying water bodies or uh, lakes etc so as you can see in the figure uh, at the bottom right there is a spectral graph showing wavelength on the x axis and reflectance on the y axis so at 0.7 micrometer here the the blue line dips down which is the uh, which is the reflectance of water in thermal in near infrared band so what it indicates is water body completely absorbs all the energy incident on it at this wavelength and therefore it appears black whereas at at the same wavelength you can see the green uh, line has maximum uh, reflectance so green corresponds to vegetation so in the same band the green light uh, the vegetation reflects maximum therefore appears bright as an example you can see the mansarovar lake appearing uh, dark in the image here whereas the surrounding areas are bright some of them are vegetation and here are here are some samples of snow etc now these data sets are used for a range of applications from land use land cover change to landscape modeling and urban growth wasteland mapping climate change and so on okay snow appears uh, white 
and has more reflectance compared to water in the near infrared band therefore it will look like a white feature on the earth surface whereas water will look black so they will they will be they are they they are clearly separable but sometimes there is a challenge to separate cloud and snow because both of them look very similar in the satellite data okay once the data are captured depending upon the sensor they are stored in different bits so for example the irs data is stored in 8 bit whereas it can range from uh, 11 bit to 12 bit to 16 bits per pixel and more the number of bits more number of objects we can discriminate or identify okay so this is a simpler uh, picture to show you how these digital how these pixels capture various entities various objects on the ground and how their reflectance is captured in is uh, is um, uh, separate pixels okay so i'll come back to the resolution once more so uh, we talked about spatial resolution so spatial resolution is the smallest smallest object that can be captured in the image okay so for example here you can see two images with 1 meter and 4 meter resolution so obviously 1 meter object is more clear compared to 4 meter uh, resolution spectral resolution number to uh, refers to the number of spectral bands in which the image is captured so here for example you see four bands here it is one band so these four bands will correspond to different wavelengths in the em spectrum then comes the temporal resolution which refers to the time interval between uh, acquisition of two subsequent images so some satellites have a revisit time of 26 days some have 15 days so a uh, image at a given place may be captured today and the next image may be captured after 15 days or after 26 days so the disadvantage is that is if any event uh, or any calamity happens between this period we do not have any way to get the data or we have to depend on some other sources for the other satellites for the data set the last one is the radiometric resolution which refers to the number of bits in which the image is captured here is an example of some of the most popular uh, space bond satellites their spectral spatial and temporal resolution now this is a very incomprehensible list of some of the most widely used uh, satellites across the globe their sen uh, the sensors spectral spatial and temporal resolution among these landsat has a very uh, old history which started long back in 1972 launched by nasa at uh, and then it continues to operate even today with landsat 8 which is the latest as of now this data uh, has a resolution of 30 meter which is used very popularly and is um, available free for the entire globe the second is the irs indian remote sensing uh, data set are captured from irs 1c 1d sensor and the resource set uh, which provide data from 88 onwards but most frequent data sets are available only 2000 onwards and they have a resolution of 5.8 to 23.5 meter recently cartosat 2 was launched which has a panchromatic sensor yeah this is the temporal resolution okay temporal resolution refers to the time interval in which the satellite will come back to the same position after rotating or after cover covering the entire globe so it may it may pass through bangalore today and it may pass through uh, bangalore after 25 days or 26 days so that is the temporal gap between two subsequent image acquisition okay on the other hand uh, yeah this term is not applicable they are mostly used for uh, telecommunication for example mobile applications or internet uh, etc but very less for uh, remote sensing purpose because they need to keep moving and taking uh, data for the entire globe yeah. what matters is the kind of aperture view footprint right because Uh, if you put the 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 is actually fixed before the satellite is launched, okay. and the entire globe is divided into rows and path and rows. Yeah. So each location is identified by a given path and row, and uh, subsequently the satellite keeps moving along the rows. like this around the globe to take pictures for various parts of the globe yeah it's not necessary that the satellite should be on top of bangalore yeah and again come back on top of bangalore yeah. mm -hmm. before it comes to bangalore and after it comes to bangalore right. or many days bangalore might be visible to the satellite 
no because it has to cover the entire globe before it comes back to the same position or else you will not be getting data for other parts of the globe yeah depends on the satellite and depends on the resolution so at a, if you take a, a, a data at a very coarse resolution it may revisit every one to two day because it will be at a higher uh, it will be at a uh, greater uh, distance from the earth surface so the resolution will not be clear but if you want a very high resolution so that you even detect a car or a bus the satellite has to be close to the earth so it will take more time to re uh, revolve around the earth to yes yes right so so do those, those will be generally high resolution data set high resolution satellites so so uh, since the image generally images are taken at a nadir view where the sensor the sensor focuses exactly at the below the uh, uh, below the ground level so if the image is captured at some angle the the image will get uh, will be at some oblique angle so it will get skewed away so your features will become blur or they may not be clear so that is why it is uh, it is a general practice to uh, take the image at the nadir view and then uh, minimize the distortion at the edges so that's why the angle is minimized so that objects become more clear while taking the photographs okay so uh, i was talking about the various satellites uh, for uh, the indian satellite and then uh, there is some cost associated with the indian satellite data which is not obviously free so uh, there is limited use only to some of the government agencies and universities coming back to icon uh, iconos is a commercial satellite by uh, space imaging inc which provides a very high resolution of 1 meter to 4 meter data sets it is available every 3 days but these are very uh, expensive data sets modis is a very popular uh, satellite which which uh, captures the, uh, the images of earth surface every 1 to 2 days so any uh, large scale calamity can be captured very frequently and can be uh, and the data can be analyzed the disadvantage is that it has a resolution of 250 meter to 1 kilometer because it it is at a very high uh, distance from the uh, very large distance from the earth surface and recently sentinel uh, series of satellites were launched by a Euro european space agency where sentinel 2b is the latest so they provide data at from 10 meter to 60 meter for various wavelength bands and are now being used across the globe this data is also free and it is available for any part of the globe okay google uses mostly of landsat data so they they kind of pay for google map google google map google earth google earth they either use uh, what is they are using planet uh, from planet earth so they pay for it, they, they pay for it yeah they pay for it but till very recent times they were using the landsat data that is how when they, when you open google earth and there is a time uh, google, map, google, google map is more like a, a, a digitized product where you see different buildings well, layers yeah right right so so they yeah no no, no. yeah they use some satellites from planet earth which is a company uh, situated in san francisco which also provides very high resolution for which uh, isro launched around 95 or 96 satellites last to last year that was one of the world record uh, created 
that uh, Google pays to uh, to Planet Earth. Planet Earth is a company uh, located in San Francisco, which has a constellation of many satellites to capture very high resolution images. India launched, India launched around 90 or 95 of yes, 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 the satellites. Yeah, last last year to last year, I think last year. Yeah. Okay. So having given uh, this small background, now what type of resolution is you can be used for what type of uh, uh, space? So at uh, the the range, the resolution can can differ from one meter to five kilometer to ten kilometer, depending upon what type of study you are doing. It's a, a, a whether it's a city-based study or you are trying to do a continental or global study at a, um, uh, for looking for some changes in vegetation, forest biomass, etc. Okay, what is the role of data mining? So here comes the role of data mining. So the term geospatial analysis is very common among the GIS community who works on this kind of data, which involves data mining algorithms, application of statistical methods and information retrieval techniques from all this geospatial data. More often than not, it also incorporates time into these, uh, these databases, which facilitates investigation of land cover and land use over a period of time through different models and, and analytics. Okay, now uh, geospatial analysis also involves integration of different types of data which are captured at different resolution and at different time periods. So they also have different units. So for example, aerial photographs, um, administrative boundary, geology, soil, land use, then these are the various satellites, uh, these are the reports. So how do you integrate all these data sets to, or to do some analysis or to perform some query given that they are captured in different units stored in different formats. So how do we integrate that? So essentially we are trying to create layers of information like rivers, roads, capitals, lakes, integrate them. Yeah. It includes, it includes, it includes. Yes, yes. So we, uh, the analysis involves integration of various data sets from various sources and then drill down across all these layers to retrieve some useful information. Okay, now I will slowly take you to the problem statement. So among these satellites, Landsat and Modis are the two most popular data sets being widely used across the globe because they are free. And they, uh, Modis is at a very high temporal resolution every one to two days. The only uh, drawback is its spatial resolution which is 250 meter to 150 meter now this brings a problem because if your if a, uh, data is of very high resolution the objects are very clear but if it is of low resolution the objects become blur so uh, take for uh, for instance this example this is a classified image of 23.5 meter by uh, data captured from IRS India remote sensing satellite and this is from modis 250 meter obviously the classified image here looks very blurred because of the resolution which is 250 meter. So the question is, is this data, even though it's available every one to two days and uh, across the globe, is this data really useful if you get this kind of blurred information? So this is one of the shortcoming of the hard classification technique where you use different uh, algorithms like SVM, random forest and so on, which classify each pixel into a given class or the classes are mutually exclusive and this results in a mixed pixel problem. So because of mixed pixel problem, the dominant class, the dominant class is assigned to that particular pixel which creates this, uh, this uh, blur impression on the image. So now this motivated uh, to, to, to look for or to develop some methods to solve this problem. So how do you use uh, uh, multi-sensor data, that is data from multiple sensors to optimally integrate information from these sensors which can, uh, add, which can uh, actually overcome the data constraints and also look for possible uh, methods that, that overcome the constraints, the, the data constraints. Pre-processing task, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, so pre-processing involves uh, various tasks, for example, data, uh, data calibration, then your uh, noise removal, then your atmospheric correction, geometric correction, radiometric correction, mosaicing. So all these steps are part of, uh, part of uh, pre-processing the data set. 
so uh, 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 pre processing will not be able to do anything with the mixed pixel problem because your inherent data yeah it it contributes but the thing is each of these data sets they are processed separately so the parameters what we use for a low resolution data doesn't apply to the high resolution data so each uh, sensor has a list of metadata which which captures information like the sun inclination angle sunlight amount of sunlight the wind speed etc while the data is being captured and these particular parameters which are of which are captured by that satellite that particular satellite are used to do the pre processing so it is more of a satellite dependent it's not a general parameter which can be applied across resolution okay so the problem uh, uh, problem boils down to this figure where you see that in a single pixel you have mixing of three objects object 1 2 and 3 here you see a different example where three objects uh, share a common boundaries within a pixel and in this last example you see a linear feature like a road passing through a pixel so all of these typically uh, form a mixed pixel problem to make it more clear uh, let's see if this is one this is one um, instance of a landsat pixel 30 meter by 30 meter and you see there are homogeneous pixels also so this is pure water but this pixel here at 1 2,1 is a is made up of vegetation and parking lot that is mixing of buildings and vegetation so what happens in a traditional per pixel classification is whichever is the dominant class is assigned to that pixel whereas in a in a mixed pixel problem we try to estimate the amount of various categories for example water vegetation and uh, uh, substrate within a within a pixel so i can say 20% settlement uh, 60% vegetation 20% water in that particular pixel so this is the basic difference between a normal classifier or and a sub pixel learning classifier okay so the objective is to develop some techniques which can help us to derive information from all these mixed pixel that is how to solve this problem so we came up with uh, various questions uh, to see how to uh, how to answer these questions by solving the mixed pixel problem so the first question is basically how to obtain the class proportion various class proportion from a pixel then the second question is how do you identify the types of classes in a mixed pixel problem because you do not have unique signatures so how do you identify the classes third is a um, case of non linear mixing model which i will discuss in subsequent slide and fourth is a um, uh, is a typical example of uh, how to uh, how to maximize the auto correlation between the classes in a given pixel so i will show you with more examples in the later slides so pixel is a basically a, a value which is called a digital number a single value no it can be an rgb rgb yeah rgb will be for the band for different wavelengths but for a single band it will be a single value or as a digital number digital number single number from G, yeah single number typically yeah. depending upon the number of bits it can take values from 0 to 255 255 are brighter objects and values towards 0 are darker objects okay so the data used in the entire studies for the satellite data for some of the indian cities we used the um, survey of india india topographical sheets some gps and uh, google earth and bhuvan were jointly used to validate the results now taking you to the same problem once again so if this is a mixed pixel having uh, three objects let's say n is equal to 1 2 3 1 2 3 and 3 so it can be it can be represented mathematically by a linear equation where y is the reflectance of this pixel at location x comma y which is equal to summation of the product of reflectance of class 1 into area of class 1 so e refers to the uh, reflectance alpha refers to the area so alpha is proportion and e is reflectance e will be later on uh, now onwards called as n member so a uh, n member is a class is a pure pixel a pixel which doesn't have any mixing of two objects but is a homogeneous generally this is a scalar quantity and there are two constraints imposed on the model 
one is the abundance non negativity constant which says that a class cannot have a negative value so we cannot have minus 20% water in a pixel and if you add all the classes in a given pixel they should be equal to 1 or 100% so with this assumption so uh, till 2008 uh, i was under the assumption that this problem can be solved using two ways one is the ordinary least square which is very popular to solve this kind of equation and other was uh, orthogonal subspace projection which was developed by professor chang from university of maryland so he is a professor in electrical and computer engineering and he assumed or he believed that a uh, image can be represented by a signal so what he did is to solve this problem he came up with a model uh, that is he divided the signal into two parts desired and undesired what is being represented here as d and u which is also called the du model and then came up with a operator p so in the process he tries to maximize the signal to noise ratio and finally it boils down to alpha p where alpha p is the abundance or proportion of the pth and member in that particular pixel so we uh, with this assumption that there are only two ways to solve the problem we just moved ahead and applied these two techniques to see how good their results are and whether their results were comparable so the p can be multiple classes p can p is multiple classes yeah exactly so Yes, yes, yes. So we we tried four different data sets with four different types of bands, different resolution, different dimension, eight thousand, two thousand, three twenty, thirty two, and we considered two classes, three classes, and four classes problem for the given scene, and then applied both the technique. So we we uh, tested the algorithm on a smart uh, small part of Bangalore city. So you can see the ray scores here and the Alsu Lake here at different resolution, one meter, four meter, twenty five meter, and two fifty meter. and here are the corresponding results so how this result is interpreted is uh, these are called gray scale images or abundance maps where the values of pixel range from 0 to 1 0 uh, each uh, class will have one single output so for example here we see vegetation and non vegetation two classes here we see urban vegetation and water three classes so this is two and three classes example here so Zero represents absence of a class. One represents full presence of a class. So, for example, Alsu Lake here in the third layer of water is bright, which is towards one. That means full presence of water. Whereas the surrounding is is black, which is which means absence of water. So we have a map for each uh, 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 map for each class separately. If I take a union of all of them, it will be white. It should be equal to one. I really look white. Yes, yes. So Urban is all the the buildings what you see here as the uh, light blue color pixels. So these are your buildings in 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 and around the city. So in this image uh, we see the maroon pixels. The red one are the vegetation or or trees or uh, parks. The black one is water body here, and this steel blue is the urban here. Okay, so we found that basically both of them uh, more or less give very similar results. so then uh, i will talk talk about this method later on in the second part of the slide so second part of the presentation so then uh, came the problem how do we uh, actually detect the end members so end members are the pure pixel uh, or or the different the reflectance of different classes in a given image so there are some existing methods to do that but uh, a simple method we thought of is why not use the same linear model and try to invert it to get the end member for each class so what we do is we take a high resolution data what we propose is take a high resolution data classify the data with some some algorithm and with a, with a good amount of training data and compute the proportion of each class so let's say if we have six class so we get alpha 1 to alpha 6 substitute alpha we know y y is the reflectance of the pixel in a in a low resolution data so we can compute e so this we if we do it for each band separately or iteratively will be able to estimate the end member for each class in the low, low resolution data <coughs> so this is a image captured from uh, north of the new airport so this is the extension of the chikballapur uh, forest area which is nandi hill and he, somewhere here is the airport this is the chikballapur town the light light blue uh, uh, pixels here this is at 25 meter this is as 250 meter so the idea is to retrieve the end member in this 250 meter pixel with the help of this high resolution data 
so so we classified this data treated this information as alpha and inverted the equation to estimate the values of e in this data so we compare this performance of this technique with a popularly popular technique called n find r with a supervised interactive technique where we used an n dimensional visualization and scatter plot to identify the n members and a, a unsupervised technique just let's say for example k means to estimate the class means of the different n members so for, uh, here i show you some a uh, scatter plot of various band combination band 6 band 5 band 7 so typically n members tend to fall in a triangle or in a square and they hold the uh, extreme pixel position so we get n member 1 n member 2 n member 3 if you keep if you re repeat this experiment with various band combination you will come up with very unique n members which can identify different classes in the image this is the uh, uh, visualization of of the six classes <clears throat> in the same image where you can see forest plantation built up water bodies are clearly separable so now we apply the algorithm on Yes, yes, yes. I will, I will show you this. Yes. So, so this is a high. Uh, sorry. This is the first row is a high resolution data set where we have tried to identify six classes: agriculture land in the Chikbalapur town. This is the Chikbalapur city, and this is the Nandi Hill forest. These are the plantation. Large, uh, large area in this Kolar district in is wasteland and very few scattered water bodies. This is the output. Second row is from the algorithm what we proposed. The third one is from the n finder, which is a full, a fully automatic technique to extract the n members. The fourth is from a supervised technique, the scatter plot what I had shown, and the sixth one is trying to use a simple clustering technique to see if we can identify the n members. So this graph shows a bidirectional plot of the method proposed here, and from n finder, which is a fully automatic technique to see how far they fall in a straight line. compared to the known class percentage and this graph shows the behavior of each of the classes across bands for each of these methods so you see that even these met, even though these methods give similar results the type of n member or the value of n member what they predict is not actually same for even within bands so so they, that, that's why they tend to give different results on classification so uh, we found that uh, this method actually works very well compared to a fully a fully uh, uh, fully automatic technique uh, and gives very realistic uh, outputs only shortcoming is that the we need higher resolution image to substitute the value for alpha okay now i'll take you to the third problem where we assume that the sunlight when we it, it hits the earth it doesn't goes back to the sensor right away so it may get uh, more reflected by hitting a tree or a aeroplane or a building or so on and then goes back goes uh, back to the so you can see multiple scattering here uh, happening here and this and then goes back to the sensor but again it forms the same type of uh, mixed pixel problem so uh, how do we handle this kind of problem we came up with a new method so uh, this is the this is the overall flow chart we use neural network and uh, uh, in conjunction with the osp which is the unmixing algorithm and uh, try to refine the uh, the unmixed output so what we do here is we have a low resolution data we use some n member extraction algorithm extract the n member get the abundance we take the abundance select 15% of the data randomly also collect the ground truth information for those 15% data feed them to a multi layer perceptron model take the all 100% of the class abundance and then test it on that and the, we keep on refining the weights here the w and v until we see that the desired output is finer compared to a uh, compared to a linear case so we first carried the experiment on a simulated data set so we had uh, a reflectance of four minerals for alunite budogonite kalonite and calcite those were uh, obtained from jet propulsion laboratory so we uh, artificially simulated 200 spectral bands so because of the number they are also called hyperspectral bands in the figure you can see band 1 band 100 band 200 and then we use this band to test our algorithm so first what we did is classify the image into four minerals uh, using their respective values then 
check whether our algorithm actually extracts the same uh, reflectance of the four minerals as given by JPL. So we plotted both and they f uh, almost fall on, f fell on the same line. So it confirmed that the reflectance value, what we are assuming to be true, is correct. Then we classified the image using the linear mission model, non-linear mission model. So the evidence was uh, uh, clear. The output from non-linear mission model was, was better compared to linear mission model. We, we compared them using various bidirectional plots. And then uh, we, we then implemented the algorithm on the real world data set. So this is again the same image of uh, Kola district, Chigwalapur town here, Dandi hill forest here. And we divided into six categories, agriculture. So you can see that this town agriculture is, uh, uh, Chigwalapur is mostly dominated by agriculture and wasteland. There are very few water bodies. And this is the city area, and this is the Nandi Hill Forest, and plantation and the water bodies. Next, uh, we compared uh, for this image both the real proportion and estimated proportion, and then uh, using correlation and RMSC, it proved that the non-linear mission model is better able to express the mixing of pixels. So it's true that things in life are actually non-linear, but for simplicity, we assume them to be linear. In order to assess the, the uh, intensity of the errors, we plotted this three-dimensional graph for each of the six uh, classes. And we found that in the northern part of Kolar, which, uh, this, there, is a, there is a large area which is actually barren. And that reflects very similar to a fallow land. So that's why there is a huge, uh, uh, huge um, uh, confusion between uh, agriculture and barren land at this location. So with both the data sets, we found that with the simulated and with the real world data set, we found that the non-linear mission model proves to be better than the linear mission model. Now, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it takes long time to train and uh, it has to, uh, it actually we did it multiple times to see whether the output what we get is what we want actually. Uh, so I think we, uh, I don't remember exactly, yeah. no, not, not that huge. So maybe very simple uh, network of three to four uh, hidden nodes and so, six, I think I remember it was six nodes. Six hidden layers, yeah. Not very complicated model. Because the more complicated it takes, more time to train and then subsequently it may give a very uh, abrupt output which is not at all useful. So we started with a very simple model to see if it, if it really worked. Okay, now, uh, till now uh, we were working on simple classes like urban, agriculture, uh, water, etc. But what happens if there is a variability within the class? For example, the, uh, the terrace of a building may be made up of cement, concrete roof, or it may be a asbestos roof, or it may be a tile roof. So how do you capture this in the, uh, this variability in the model? We came up with a, with a me uh, method called VECLS, variable end member constant least square, which we, which we gave the name. So, so here we, co we uh, collect samples of the different classes separately. For example, tile roof or cement roof or asbestos roof, and then create a, a, a covariance matrix for that particular class, and then try to use it for to, to uh, use it to differentiate the interclass uh, uh, in the image. So the idea is to separate, uh, maximize the uh, maximize the uh, interclass variation, so that you are able to capture all the smaller differences and then classify the image. So uh, here are some few uh, outputs. So uh, this is a, there are three types of case studies we did. One is a small variability within the class. For example, water could be turbid water, clear water, or water with uh, some green plant. Medium variability and large variability. So, and these are the outputs. So we compared them with a standard method where we assume that there is zero covariance and where, uh, in the method where we assume that there is some covariance between the classes. And we found that both using correlation and RMSC, it performed better compared to assuming that there is no, uh, there is no uh, difference between the classes. Finally, um, once you get the output from any of the unmixed algorithm, it tells you what is the proportion of class A, B, C in a pixel, but it doesn't tell you which side of the pixel is the class. So for example, if it is a one kilometer by one kilometer pixel, and I say that there is 80% building, but I, the algorithm doesn't say which side of the pixel is 80%. So 
so in case uh, uh, that information is not available you may end up uh, you may end up uh, putting the class in a wrong side okay so uh, here uh, we actually didn't develop the algorithm but came up with a uh, algorithm uh, extended algorithm proposed by atkinson pm who used it for a different purpose and uh, uh, we try to see if this could be used to solve this problem so what it does it it is it it actually tries to maximize the auto correlation between the pixels so so in some sense it will work in several iterations for each iteration for each pixel for each sub pixel for each neighboring sub pixel within a window so this works in a smaller window we calculate a parameter called a which is called the attractiveness parameter and then for two adjoining sub pixels we compare them if one is less than the other we try to swap them that is why the name swap, uh, swapping algorithm so this was tested on simulated data set we artificially created a triangle and a, and a circle we we blurred the edge of the triangle make it mixed pixel we then apply the algorithm so you can see instances of pixel swapping happening we get it the, the same way as it was original same thing was tried on a circle we artificially blurred the image again ran the algorithm we could get the perfect circle then we applied on the real world data set this is for bangalore city this is a high resolution data set and this is a, a low resolution data set unmixed data set so this is urban and non urban so 0 to 1 value we apply the algorithm and then see this is the out output of the urban so this should actually match this this is from high resolution this is from the low resolution data so using several metrics this was uh, this was uh, the, the accuracy was checked for both the data sets and then the image was divided into 14 cross 14 blocks each block having 100 by 100 pixels so because uh, because overall accuracy may be high but if you compare at a local level the accuracy doesn't match so we divided into 14 cross 14 blocks and then try to see if the actual proportion matches the predi the predicted proportion uh, the predicted proportion from the algorithm and they seem to fall on a straight line with a good correlation so the only disadvantage with this method is that uh, uh, if uh, if the number of neighbors are very uh, uh, low the speed of the algorithm is good but the output is not very satisfactory and the other precaution is that if the number of neighbors that is the kernel size or window size should not be so large that a given sub pixel is attracted to other sub pixel that it cannot neighbor so that is one of the limitation of the algorithm so right now we tested with only two uh, classes binary classes one and zero urban non urban water non water but definitely there is a scope to extend this to multiple classes how can you swap the pixels if there are multiple classes present in the image so this led to a, a new classifier called the hybrid bayesian classifier so we modified the original bayesian classifier and call it the hybrid bayesian classifier what we did is uh, this is high resolution data this is the posterior probability which we uh, have collected from the ground for each of the classes okay and this is the low resolution data we unmix it using the technique discussed here and we get the abundance map this abundance is treated as prior probability so posterior probability is obtained from the ground prior is obtained from the unmixed image and we found that this uh, this uh, uh, this new method called hybrid bayesian classifier actually performs better this is the collar district here we have used the uh, listri data and the modi data and here we have this is part of bangalore city here we have used the uh, quick bird uh, the iconos data of 4 meter and lancer data of 30 meter this has six classes this has again six classes and here is the accuracy assessment so what we found is that hybrid bayesian classifier actually performs 6% better for uh, list and modi data and 9% better for iconos and lancer data for can compare to a normal bayesian classifier yeah 6% improvement is a huge improvement uh, i mean in in case of a land use map or land use analysis yeah okay so to conclude the first part of the talk uh, uh, i i just talked about linear unmixing non linear unmixing n member extraction n member variability and pixel swapping so now we will move uh, a bit one step ahead Yes. Right. So we have many sources of data. Right. One of the 
I have not looked into that. But maybe, yeah, maybe I think this is the right time to look at uh, the deep learning and the new model. What is the? Yeah, yeah, this has been used. Not, yeah, that has been used. That has been used, and there were papers even this year and last year uh, in IT pre transactions. Yes. Multiple classes. Yes. 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 Which says a part of the pixel which belongs to one region should go there. Go, go, should go so there, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. People have, uh, people have used Markov random fields in trying to solve this kind of problem. And the third question I just want to point out, while it is deep learning, poses the problem as a mask estimation. That is, they try to find a mask which separates the picture. Right. And if there are two sources, they try to find a mask which separates two sources. Right. So, are there notions of this mask learning? I, I have not uh, used deep learning to solve this kind of problem, but maybe uh, yeah, I can try to explore uh, deep learning to see if this that can be used in trying to because I am now planning to do this kind of study for entire country. So definitely, uh, maybe trying new options would be a good idea. Given that now we have a very high computing uh, systems available in our, at, at the institute, so definitely that would be useful. So I will definitely try that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 This is based on the physical model. Yeah. Based. Yes. Physics allows us to do that. Yes. Yes. So they have. There have been studies for for last almost two decades where people slowly came up uh, came up with this technique. And the first one was published in 1991 where they had used the first physical model. Uh, to see if this could solve the mixed pixel problem. Yeah. So now I would uh, go ahead and uh, try to show you some case study of the same thing at a very at a, a very large scale. So uh, given that now we have so many different types of satellites launched by different countries, continuously monitoring the Earth's surface and capturing the data, we have huge amounts of uh, uh, remote sensing data being captured. Uh, from petabyte to exabyte to zettabyte to yottabyte. So these are particularly new terms of data storage. And as per an estimate, NASA gathers approximately 1.73 GB of data every 10 seconds. And it is expected that climate change data may, may grow up to 350 petabytes by end of 2030. So all this uh, brings new arrays of problem and how to store the data, how to process the data. So I will touch upon some of the work which was being carried out uh, while I was there uh, to handle this kind of big data sets using a high uh, performance computing architecture. And they call this architecture as uh, NASA Earth Exchange, NEX, where they have various uh, data sets, algorithms, methods, models available. So I'll just keep that. So this is the high performance computer architecture here. And this is the hyperwall. Uh, which is made up of 150 monitors joined together, which is used to visualize images. And I also spent some time at CSAIL at MIT and uh, some time at Stanford to solve, to work with professors to solve this kind of problem. So I will be talking about uh, the Earth, NASA Earth Exchange, the unmixing algorithm, which I also showed you just now, and the data and some findings from this, uh, this study. So before that, I had spent almost one and a half years working with the NEX group on uh, developing the NASA Earth Exchange. So, uh, just uh, to give you an insight, in the time it took you to read this sentence, NASA gathered approximately 1.73 GB of data from nearly 100 activations, and this is done every hour, every day, every year, and the collection is growing exponentially. So, with this, a lot of uh, data inherent problem comes. How do you store a lot of data? How do you access this, this amount of data? How do you scale your methods? How do you process such large data sets? And some of these data are not analysis ready. So uh, to answer uh, your question, most of the data what we obtain from satellite are not actually analysis ready. So how do we, how do we uh, uh, 
uh, cater to this problem. So recently, all these space agencies they came up with a very robust algorithm which can at least do some amount of pre-processing. For example, atmospheric correction or haze removal or uh, data missing problem or radiometric correction. So these are now uh, these are now almost uh, inbuilt in the uh, during the data manufacturing process, and these data sets are almost almost in a position that you can download and start using that. But uh, but eventually they do not take into account a mixed pixel problem or uh, any other resolution problem. They only work at the uh, atmospheric correction level. Okay, so uh, lot of these data sets are uh, are redundant. So uh, so one of the one of the problem is that a lot of investiga uh, investigators spend a lot of time trying to download the same data set, trying to develop similar uh, codes, similar m uh, methods, and they do not share. So a lot of work is repeat repeated again and again. To see that a lot of work is redundant, among almost 180 institutions in US, they published five or more papers in 12 years of span just based on the Moody's data. So they, they tend to download the same data set and carry on similar analysis. So we thought of... Uh, developing a model to uh, to provide science as a service so that the name uh, uh, the name of this model was nasa nasa earth exchange where we thought of uh, de developing a virtual collaborative platform where scientists researchers professors can work together and share their knowledge they they will they can use or share tools computing power access to big data sets and use innovative and uh, approaches which has already been developed so how it works is currently they have 400 members from different universities and different uh, research organizations. They have a central repository of data with 2.3 petabytes. And then they have uh, scalable computing resources, various softwares, codes, and then they share workflows, models, and reusable software. So there are a lot of organizations from North America which also share this data. And uh, they provide uh, something like a mirror site where data can be downloaded from any part of the globe. So there are both NASA users and non-NASA users. So they pass through authentication. This is their storage facility where they have all the climate data, remote sensing data, and this is the computing architecture. So where they, they or every, even, even us, we can get a account and process the data right, right away from here. So some of the large scale projects which are now being carried out using the uh, NASA exchange is vegetation biomass at 100 meter resolution for the entire globe high resolution climate projection, Landsat data mosaicing, uh, mapping fallow land in California. Then, uh, uh, so they are moving more from, uh, more from uh, moving towards a data driven approach by doing large scale, uh, large scale analysis for cities. There are some other big projects like uh, global drought monitoring and then uh, TRMM for India. So national climate assessment and so on. So there are many other projects which are parallelly being going on. Now I'll take you to the same problem what we had discussed some time back about the mixed pixel. So uh, I have already introduced this topic and then the model I was talking about till now actually uh, proved to be a bit useful going by the saying that essentially all models are wrong but some are useful. So this proved out to be a bit useful model in actually solving the global uh, pro problem at a global scale. So uh, I then uh, went through some literatures and found that uh, there are not only two methods, but there are 20 methods to solve this problem. And within a span of six years, almost 18 papers came one after another trying to show some method way to solve this problem. They were br uh, brief, uh, briefly, they were clubbed into sparse regression methods, signal subspace, subspace methods, geometrical methods, and, and statistical method. So now the challenge becomes that whether should you develop the 21st method or we should look for one of the methods from this and try to apply so we first thought of evaluating all these 20 different techniques belonging to these four domains and see if they are scalable, computationally efficient, accurate, and they are robust to noise. So along the way, uh, we found that the basic method what we were implementing till now uh, proposed by Chang was quite useful. So we contacted them and he provided us the code. Then I realized that the method which I had used long time back was not fully constrained, but it was just a constraint least square without any imposing any constraint. So I also used to get negative abundance as, at that time. So then he told that uh, the fully constant least square is quite difficult to implement. 
because both the A and C and A C has to be applied simultaneously, which does which is difficult to uh, do uh, to get an optimal solution. So he he uh, gave us his code, and we tried that code, and we found that for a 8000 by 8000 image size, it takes almost two and a half hours to to unmix. So he referred uh, uh, he referred uh, this uh, Lawson and Hansen book solving least square problem. to us and told that you can adapt any of the method there and see if it can increase the processing time so we adopted the non negative least square from this book which is a, which is a extension which fcls follows and then we could significantly gain up on time and then uh, with a similar accuracy so we could reduce the time from 2 hours uh, to almost 2 and a half minutes and then uh, uh, okay now now using this we first uh, carried out a rigorous comp comparative evaluation of all the 20 algorithms currently available in literature i'll show you the results in subsequent slides now uh, we wanted to process the data for entire world so the biggest challenge was how to get the n members so n members in a small area is quite easily achievable we can look into google earth you can visit the place with a gps get the coordinates but at a global level uh, it's difficult to define the number of classes as well as the number of samples so one of our uh, collaborative partner um, small christopher small he works in university of columbia he carried out a study at the same time in 2013 where he came up with a model that could uh, that could reflect the entire globe in just three classes one of them is substrate which includes soil sediment rocks and non photosynthetic vegetation vegetation includes green photosynthetic plant and dark objects include deep water ocean or shadows etc so what he did is very briefly he took landsat data from 100 locations across the globe which belong to different biome types and different landscape okay then he came up with a uh, model that could uh, retrieve signature of three classes substrate vegetation and dark objects which i had explained in the last slide and he told that these could Uh, these these three could actually represent the entire globe so he has actually done a very rigorous statistical uh, uh, validation of the signatures and with the ground truth and he has he has represent shown in this in this paper which i will skip here it's also available at this particular website so we used uh, these three models and try to see if those could be used for at for an entire global data processing so we first used a computer simulated data where we artificially introduced the white noise and i include include a variance in the noise from 0 2 4 8 16 32 128 256 to see, to see if algorithm is really robust even if you add more and more noise to the data and then um, applied this algorithm on two different scenarios one was a urban scenario where we took a small part of san francisco city near the golden gate bridge and one part near the central california which is a agriculture land near near a city called fresno then uh, we thought if this we if we succeed validating our method with these three then we will apply it on the global data so the to give you a idea of the global data set it this scene is made up of this uh, image is made up of 8003 landsat scenes okay this data is available every month but for simplicity we took it just for uh, just the yearly data not the monthly data because monthly data would not give us much changes across the globe each uh, is seen here is made up of 5295 rows into 5295 columns so roughly they approximate to 224 billion pixels into six spectral dimension so it was a huge data set to process and then to mosaic so mosaicing also is is a time consuming job so uh, the the algorithms 20 algorithms were first validated rigorously using this uh, criteria uh, range correlation rmsc sre probability of success etc and then uh, we compared all these algorithms which are listed here it it is not quite visible but they are written with smaller fonts and this is a graph of correlation and uh, rmsc this is probability of success so we found that among all the fully constant least square is really robust across noise levels so then we use this fully constant least square method which where we get uh, obtain uh, increment uh, obtain some uh, enhancement in time com time complexity so we use that fully constant least square to almost uh, uh, classify 0.3 uh, 0.35 million uh, images of the entire globe so what we did is we use this data set uh, use a global n member developed by professor uh, christopher small use a high performance computing architecture get the abundance map 
of substrate vegetation dark objects then use all three along with some signatures from forest farmland and water and use a random forest classifier to get these three classes on the other hand substrate which represents um, uh, ground, uh, which depends urban area or maybe barren rocks we used a data called dmsp ols night time data so what it does is it will capture the amount of light being reflected from a city so if there are street lights or lights on a bus stand or roads or buildings it will capture all that light and this light can be used to extract cities because you will come to know where is the boundary of the cities so we use that data uh, that night time light data to come up with the uh, uh, model that could give us the urban extent uh, in uh, across uh, across the data set and then this was validated by two standard data set one is a national land cover data set which is a periodically generated by usgs and other is our nafd north american forest dynamics data set which is again uh, generated by noaa noaa is, is a agency which is responsible for generating this kind of co continental maps for uh, every year so this was done for 2011 now this was the computing platform used we there are four supercomputers and these are some of the state of the art supercomputers with almost 29 petabytes of storage and 2.2 uh, 250000 cpu cores and uh, they have almost 4 gb per core so 128 gb per node of memory so we implemented uh, this using the pleiades supercomputer and here you can see the mosaic of uh, almost uh, 8000 scenes for substrate this is for dark objects this is for vegetation we parallelly computed ndvi ndvi is normalized difference vegetation index which gives you green versus non green to see if the n member what we have used actually represents actually is represented by uh, ndvi or not so you can see that the green patches here correspond to the green patches here which show that the amount of vegetation being detected globally is quite Uh, quite uh, uh, satisfactory this work was published in the yeah. journal remote sensing last year so now validation of this whole uh, global data set was quite difficult so we narrowed down to a small a smaller state of california where we could get the ground information and uh, what you see here is uh, this is a fractional map uh, from unmixed data set representing forest this is plantation or uh, farmland so this is one sample where you can see water body farmland appearing as light green bright patch forest appearing as dark dark green patch this is uh, this is the forest area extracted from here this is the plantation area this is the water body and this is the output obtained from random forest without using the unmixed output and this is the output from a national report north american forest dynamic report now this, uh, to show you in more detail this is san luis Re reservoir near fresno and this is a highway this is a reservoir these are the canals so this is the output from the algorithm what we proposed this is out the output from normal random forest and this is the output from the north american forest dynamics uh, project now these are the two urban areas we studied one is the san francisco bay area and one is the greater los angeles area so these are the two false color true color composite this is the night time light data which captures all the light intensity across the roads buildings in and around the city so it is in uh, the the unit is nanowatts per centimeter square per stadium and this in conjunction with this output was uh, used as a threshold to obtain all the city areas so this is san francisco bay area this is the greatest los angeles area and this output is if you do not use anything but just the image and the training data you and the random forest you get this kind of output okay validation was done across the state by taking 100 samples for spread over northern to southern part of the state and they there were separate samples for forest for farmland for water as blue dots and for built up area or the cities as the red dots and then uh, this was analyzed using a confusion matrix and then trying to get the uh, producers users and overall accuracy here in this graph we used all the 100 samples on the x axis we call them patch number and this is the proportion what has been predicted by our algorithm by random forest by nlcd report and by nafd report so uh, by one uh, uh, so at a glimpse it is clear that the red area here farmland is overestimated by random forest whereas these three lines here 
uh, by random forest and inner city they match to some extent so there are there were some differences found between each of these classifiers so even within the government agencies the reports are not same they 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 also generate reports uh, or, or the maps which keep on varying among themselves so there is no standard data set which you can say that this is the best output but this are supposed to be the one which on which we will rely because they are published by the government so um, we got almost 6% uh, uh, improvement i'll show in the next slide then one of the in the similar project what we were doing is to cl classify the all individual trees in the entire us so we had almost 500000 uh, images taken from nap uh, project nip national agriculture uh, project so they have a drone a uav which they fly and take images and this is not done every year so for that we use the cnn architecture and uh, i'll show you some results here uh this is the all the individual trees in entire state of california and this is for the san francisco area where each tree has been mapped using the 1 meter the special resolution is 1 meter so the data has become huge and huge so it the uh, supercomputer took almost 3 weeks to uh, do the whole calculation this is the forest percentage in entire country given by the 1 meter data set for each of the state how much forest they have so this is all barren Texas and all are barren. This is Nevada is all barren. There is some amount of greenery here and some amount of greenery in the uh, eastern part. Okay, so this is the output of the uh, California state for six classes using the unmixed algorithm. What I was uh, showing. So now I would uh, conclude uh, this talk, and we came up with a full state of the art method which could which which could be scalable and could be used for at a global level. x per for it gave a 6% improvement and achieved a accuracy of 91% in the entire uh, area what we considered compared to some of the standard data sets and this may be a new work to uh, to showcase that now global global level fractional maps can also be obtained uh, 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 going away from the traditional ways of classifying the data sets so with this i would like to end my talk